Association's 2021 Interdiscipl Interdisciplinary Conference on Men and Masculinities, Poetry, Performance, and Scholar in Residence Address. I'm Jeff Cohen, uh, AMSA president, and I'll be introducing our poetry performer in just a few moments. This conference and live stream are being hosted by the University of Washington Tacoma. As such, we'd like to begin with the University of Washington Tacoma land acknowledgement. We recognize that all of us at UW Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on, tra on the traditional territory of the Puyallup. As people on this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial, and all our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as, as we continue our work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. We also want to acknowledge and honor Juneteenth. While Juneteenth is officially tomorrow, it is also in an observance today as a newly established national holiday in the United States. As an organization dedicated to the critical study of men and masculinities, AMSA recognizes the extent to which acts of racial violence, particularly on the part of police and other state actors and institutions, are symptoms of the United States history of racism, white supremacy, and heteromasculine patriarchal stru structures. AMSA is clear and open in our critique of systems of oppression and their link to problematic constructions and expressions of masculinities as articulated in our organizational mission and values. We recognize our history and current reality as a predominantly white male organization, both in membership and in leadership, that has often fallen short in addressing issues of racial justice. Through both action and inaction, we have done harm. We believe these matters must be addressed in sustained practice and consistently, rather than through singular solutions or resolutions. Meeting this charge will require having difficult dialogues, but more importantly, disrupting the systemic inequities that exist in our organization and the field of critical masculinity studies. We must strongly disavow racism and other injustices and challenge ourselves both individually and collectively to grow, to grow if our vision to transform lives through leadership and innovation is to come to fruition. We stand in solidarity with those impacted by the history of racial violence, and we recognize that words alone will not suffice. Clear, measurable, and direct action on the part of AMSA is needed, and we are committed to moving forward with this in mind. And now it is with great pleasure that I can introduce to you John Gavin White, who will be performing his poetry for us today. John Gavin White is a poet, philosopher, and educator. With dual degrees in philosophy and women and gender studies, White's research is centered at the intersection of the poetic as a lived philosophy and black male self-recovery in the United States. The former is the philosophy that reframes any attempt at a unified treatment of emotion, logic, language, and thought against the backdrop of oppression, the space of tension, of imaginative intensity between freedom and constraint where the fragmented contemplates wholeness, while the latter is when such an attempt is undertaken by primarily cisgendered heterosexual black males as a means of interrogating the historical erasure of the vulnerability as human beings within a context of perpetual dehumanization. John Gavin White has been featured several times on the world famous Apollo Amateur Night, along with having performed or lectured at a number of universities in the US and abroad, ranging from University of Minnesota to Queen University of Belfast in Ireland, to the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. His debut poetry collection, I, John the Conqueror, A New Spelling of My Name, is available for purchase through a direct link on his Instagram page, at John Gavin White. Please join me in welcoming John Gavin White. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, given, you know, this weekend, Juneteenth, Father's Day, um, it's only right that I started off like this. Um, as a black boy, I had a beautiful mouth. Said hello to the world, then poof, no more mouth. You see, there's a kind of black swallows hold under a relatively new but still undone sky. And there's the kind of black howling with flames taken in through the nose. The latter was forced upon me, so I stood with lineage lost on the loans. However, the unraveled fatigue of lineage found strategically placed a calloused, uncompromising collection of carbon and oxygen with a certainty of goodness and a philosopher's stone of a heart right next to me, i.e a big black good man of a father. And by big black good man of a father, I mean he who not only went outside and did not die, but he who went outside and always came back. My big black good man of a father was all I needed in my childhood hometown of Union, New Jersey, which at the time was an amalgamation of rain, misplaced bones, and liberal-minded white folk, many who my big black good man of a father spoke to in elevated tongue. And when I say elevated tongue, I mean 10 toes down. And when I say 10 toes down, I mean my big black good man of a father was unbearably human. Unbearably human in that, although I wanted a closed fist, it was with nothing but an open palm and ancestral vernacular that my big black good man of a father one time hijacked a white man's body and by becoming a momentary maker of its soul because the original white male inhabitant thought he was history's maker of me forced it to apologize for peeling the skin off my good Christian name. My big black good man of a father kept his chest open and warned me not of white folk wanting me, but white folk needing me, as in hunger, the Bible, on both sides of tomorrow, me, phantasm of a prelude to whatever pathology white folks deem worthy of consumption. My big black good man of a father kept white folk from feeding on me told me to tell them farewell to the flesh, hence my brave and unshaken body. This body is my body and my body has my father's face. And to this day, every white person I come across, the face of my big black good man of a father peers peerlessly into, reminding me almost on cue, same as before, same as before, son. Always give white folk a chance to become human and if they refuse, just make sure that you remain one. So I felt like I had to, you know, start it off with that in celebration of um, Black fatherhood. Um, black father that was successful. My father is an ideal father, sacrificed things for me and my brothers that I would never dream of sacrificing for um, my daughters. But um, yeah, so I, Johnny Conqueror, a new spelling of my name is the title of my book, which was released by Indeville Publishing um, in February, 2021. Um, some people catch the new spelling of my name, the appropriation of Audre Lorde's last books, I mean, but the I, John the Conqueror um, part is a little bit more, so I have to, I feel compelled to explain it. Um, a late, late queer literary critic, um, Rudolph P. Berg, about 20 years ago, maybe 25, wrote an essay called The Tradition of John, A Mode of Black Masculinity, where he articulated his desire to summon a power that can possibly serve as a new foundation, a new mode of black masculinity and manhood. And obviously while speaking to numerous polyrhythmic, previously unarticulated possibilities for black male agency, Byrd also saw it as posing as potentially the greatest threat to Western empires in whatever form, whatever fashion, along with the many fossilized notions of black masculinity and manhood spawned by such empires and which presently confound so many black males today. So he goes to Zora Neale Hurston's rendering of the High Johnny Conqueror folktale, which is where the Br'er Rabbit folktale is based upon, which is how you get Bugs Bunny. But so with High Johnny Conqueror, how Zora Neale Hurston put it or articulated it, you know, you have a West African king who was enslaved, um, who bodies forth power, resourcefulness, and resilience, symbolizing black folks' capacity to resist endure and prevail with our humanity intact. And he's a trickster figure whose principal attributes were mother wit, and mother wit has to be first, mother wit, W-I-T, love, laughter, courage, hope, 
and these enabled um, High John in his daily battles with someone referred to as Old Massa um, to win without any outside showing force, without any brute force, as Zora Neale Hurston put it. So Bird articulated Old Massa holistically in that by interrogating how the number of Black Old Masters Black males are up against in the world today, along with however number of old masses we have gestating internally, we can possibly win in a more permanent, more whole way as opposed to fragmentary. And my writing, anything you hear now is rooted within, is invocation rooted within the very power and possibility, rooted within a vision of masculinity and manhood that Bird viewed as, you know, where vulnerability is viewed as a source of power. So my book is half poetry, Half philosophy um, is set up semi autobiographically. There are no titles to the pieces. So um, if I'm not speaking in between the pieces, I'll just pause, give a hard delivery pause so you can know when one poem ends and the other begins. So, but it's prologue, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, then the epilogue, which is about 50 pages explaining my lit philosophy of poetic, black male self recovering in the US, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to say the prologue right now. I was but a boy, a black boy, circling himself when the magnifying glass of my memory spotted a trail of fire ants laboring inside me from loin to heart to mouth. Needless to say, the mere utterance of family set my tongue aflame. There weren't many options for a black boy with a mouthful of ash, so I began writing. I write until right, and the night became my right and my right alone. I write eyes wide shut and face the day. I face the day and write until the swirling corona of the sun thickens and my shadow is replaced by a murder of black crows. Not to sound too linear, but this is my history. Given my history, I'm unable to take serious any black man with any kind of writing utensil in hand until seeing prophecy as description, he splits open his first darkness and riddles enough light into a box for the first black boy he sees unknowingly in need. Now, at the risk of romanticizing redemption, I have two children who are not black boys, but they do have hearts. And the heart, if kept true, grows to be emblematic of encounter. And I hope the hearts of my children grow bright more and they see a bit of me and a few black boys they encounter somewhere down the road that empties out into an ocean. And the oceans are the bolter, you see, because one time after realizing the sky is blue like the ocean, which is blue like the sky, I saw my escape and pressed my pen to the rushing current between prayer and mercy. I pressed my pen to the crescent wave between black ink and black skin. Heavy with faith, I walk the water because I cannot swim. Each step, an exit is parting. I walk the water down, certain there is more. I walk the water down to the sweetest trap door and the deepest trench of the deepest floor. The beauty of the black male body fashioning its own freedom so close to Earth's core the beauty of a black man between ocean and thirst, fashioning both exit and entry through a single door. There is another version of the gospel where the distinction between cross and crucifix is made explicit. One is merely a symbol unable to accommodate the human body while the other is a device created solely for human torture. I grip my pen with a tent on fashioning the page out of the ladder. I find my place. There is blood. I am hung with a misted head. Two pre-adolescent daughters at my feet. I keep my eyes closed long enough for my mother, for their mother to explain my body's first tremor, my holy trinity of a moral compass. I open my eyes and bear witness to their circumference. My flesh is weak, but deliberate. I once wrote to recognize the lives of my sweet daughters spawned in hopes of redemption and now know the selfishness of such an act. And thus I must fight my own collapse. I now write to free my children of me. The gentle miracle of a black man capable of pronouncing each demon and obstruction by name. A black man allowed to rage and weep on both sides of the grave. The resurrection that follows him sailing his own blood willingly. The empty that is rendered full when extending his breath is made a prerequisite to the most sable of sanctuary. The fullness 
of a black man who knows where he belongs and stays there. My daughters have to witness the page crucify me so I can ponder new tongue and warm soil, come back and stay here. The God in me having done the same. Deicide, committing on the old for a new name. Heaven, accompanied by new sky. Hell, accompanied by new flame, which might explain why I call for God and the spiraling of daddy I love you fattens the air with brown femininity. I mean, if the heart is the upshot of a petrol prayer, then the flesh and bone seed seeded partially from my own tongue proves that God is good. And it is good that I keep a journal filled with too many questions for me to remember because the first question ask God directly, what are the rules of possibility? This question being first due to the fact I have two daughters who are both full-hearted, fragile, and finite. Did I need to know exactly how many doors does the finite contain? and how varied are the doors for my daughters to walk through them? How brightly will they pay for every threshold cross? Is there at least one language cast from paradise capable of charting the meaning of black girl majestic as originally meant to be charted? Dear God, I need answers. I have too much paternal pride to admit this outside of empathetic ether, but sometimes I feel as if my daughters are myths sent to mother the maternal missing in me. Yeah, so black male, black male self-recovery in the U.S., um, trying to break the monotony, it, it deals with, among many other things, it frames, it takes the seemingly trite and non-revelatory statement that black man is in crisis and views it through an etymological lens where the word crisis is understood um, as originating from the um, Latin word cronan, K-R-I-N-E-I-N, which means literally to decide, to choose. So when you say you're having a crisis, why is it a crisis? You're saying that you're in a situation that only you got yourself in and only you can get yourself out, but you don't know the choices that led to it, which is why the crisis and no one can make that choice for you. So I, within black male self-recovery, I see black males, particularly cisgendered, heterosexual black males, having been endowed with sort of double vision or there's a a choosing between the ideological trappings of white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, and what um, literary critter, a cultural scholar, Hortes J. Spiller referred to as the heritage of the mother. And what she means by that is given the distinct, given the shared psychic and physical trauma of black males and black men shared with black women throughout child slavery, there's this distinct familial tie to the maternal. And Hortes J. Spiller asserting, I agree, in um, her essay, Mama's baby and Papa's maybe, um, that the black man embodied the only community of men in America whose whose survival is directly contingent upon learning from the feminine within, on being handed by the mother, you know. And I know that may be sound contrary to various cultural narratives within popular mainstream about black men, but um yeah, and a great deal of my work, you know, is trying to unveil or lift the veil um, off the lived human experiences of black men such as myself. So who um, have no problem being vulnerable, no problem um, honoring the integrity of the maternal. Um, with that being said, uh, here I bury nothing. Here, is the illicit burn of sanctity and release, my bold and radiant tongue. Here I summon the frantic magic of spit to give things that abandon black boys proper etymology. Things that abandon black boys puncture the English language like shrapnel once properly named. My blackest of black, engendered between lightning strike and thunderclap, rebukes the gospel and glory of my supposed end as simply a name. The shaping of silence proclaims me black and alive, and this is simply something crucibles of English can contain. Believe me, it tried. But with the black bright of a pen, I replied, wholeness is no trifling matter, and proceeded to roll my eyes. Yeah, I did that. I took vows and consonants failed in cursey and gave my two daughters names that, upon pronouncement, prompts English to bellow memory for mercy. I did that, and I don't run. I am a black man who riddles a yokeless alphabet with the lucid curvature of tongue. Indeed, Baldwin forewarned that English was a bit too sunshine, 
upon his bone dry, bone right signature, the need of indelible theories of blackness convening. And then there's Tony's legacy, a warring ebony of blood impugning the ivory of paper to seek meaning within meaning, meaning when is something that is not us at daybreak in just enough history, enough blood nectar to become us by day's end? Or should I just bet it all, perforating a pink and alabaster underbelly of dialect with my pen? Big game black hunter, parading a grisly blue-eyed vernacular of a wing. Its skin is didactic camouflage, fitted perfectly to the curve of my name in this wilderness that I'm in. Fuck it. What's meant to be is meant to be. If I can be free, then I will just be a mystery. I owe my pen a serious debt for this burden, a black man who pushes out from his tired skin towards whatever is luminous in a lion's eyes, spending more days than Jesus did in the wilderness. They say it was a desert, but I know the wilderness is worse. This black man anoints himself inward facing, the tongue of his scarred body wrapped around unscarred affirmation. Geography is faint, so begin here. Palpable paranoia. Forced between invisibility and mask, my old theology I can no longer use. My new theology, I discover God does not exist in desperation, so my new theology moves, needed on firmament of maternal fact, maternal continuum, this erotic of black, demanding no typical piety. My new theology is stripped of artifice, pretense, so the Godhead is whatever the pen sees inside of me. I preach the gospel to my two daughters. That is, until they anoint themselves, offering their own creation stories. Genesis of a second and third universe rebelling against the first. Genesis of new wants, curving the distance between sundown and sunrise. Foretelling revelations of new skies, heavily adorned. Foretelling revelations of merciful winds. Of clouds needing less of earth than ever before. Foretelling revelations of merciful winds massaging love addled oceans and the countless black boys those oceans may choose to one day pick bad ashore. How am I on time? Okay. Okay, then I'll finish with this then. My two younger brothers and I, black and unsure, or rather black and waiting by the shore understood our father is found. We were lost. Our father, a cocoa color paradox of transparency and monolith spoke thresholds and dared us to cross. We crossed. My two younger brothers crossed back. I stayed. In watery warm darkness, tongue collapsing, riddled with fright. My father, ever the long unseen hand reached beyond and above to turn on the lights to which upon reconstruction, with a blanket of ocean pulled back, I saw what I believed to be a garden of ghost orchids and decided to wear it as a vest. My father promised as long as I kept it on, bullets were not bullets, but butterflies that can enter only his chest, his heart. My father and I are still alive to this day. So are my brothers, but they're stuck sounding out their names in the dark. I have not spoken to either of them in over a decade. I say this as a means to keep right. It's very rare that members of the same family grow up in the same household. I was never the same once my mother kicked me out of my first household. And by never the same, I mean hope became scourge and scourge became open moon. So please, if you ever see me, be careful how you acknowledge me. Pain is simply another ocean. Trauma, it's delta mid extension. And what's the river of suffering to he who's had countless crucifixions and all of them well attended? He who rebels when any synonym for theory that carries his name is mentioned. He who is unlimited caricature at best. Man not assemblage of a body consumed. He who needs only a single ribbon of merciless light to tie whatever it is white folk deem pensive of black male flesh to a helium balloon upswept by the seething winds of memory. There is that one memory though, as a verb shifting boy caught peeking through the keyhole of my father's despair while he was undressing rage and I stood erected. My masturbatory response to having a clenched fist is never unwelcomed. It's bigger than me. It's bigger. Thomas, in a darkened theater, grasping his historic heft with madness seeming so voluptuous, but he, like I, can never seem to release our demons. He, like I, will exit far more grand than how we entered. The world is a stage. There was nothing but applause when black men exit, huh? Fuck it. There was never enough sky anyway for me to enter the stage on cue. And honestly, if the earth has never appeared to you as a gaping mouth, ain't shit you and me can talk about. 
I've had too many things belonging outside, inside. I've had multiple sons bear down on me in myriad weather. But a real nigga will claim each and every one of his shadows for really it's whatever. A real nigga will show you the dungeon where he barter with all kinds of madness. Negotiated with silence, all types of sanity until there is nothing left. But a real nigga knows that he is worthy of breath, even after his last breath. I once held a knife to a pen for threatening to expose me. I grew past exposure and now hold my pen to knives for clarity. I forced them to cut a hole into the page the size of God's mouth. I forced God to speak. I forced my name into scripture. I pressed scripture down into a single mercy. God have mercy on me. Forgive me, Father. More so than sin, this nigga has seen. Thank you. Oh, goodness. Thank you, John. Uh, such beautiful and powerful poetry. I really appreciate, really appreciate you. And let me be uh, one to uh, convey to you a happy Father's Day. Uh, best of luck with your two daughters. Yes, thank you. And any, you know, please, you know, follow me, John Gavin White, Instagram handle, um, the link for my book there. And yes, please. There's a lot more where that came from. Wonderful. And we look forward to a time when you can join us in person for, for another AMSA conference and performance. We really appreciate it. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. So we're going to take a, a short uh, one minute break and we'll return in a moment with our scholar in residence uh, address.
All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Wherever you may be or whatever time zone you may be in, welcome to the Scholar in Residence Address with the American Men's Studies Association Conference for the year 2021 with our esteemed Scholar in Residence, Dr. Cesare Warren. I'm Joseph Nelson, and I will be the host for our address. And to briefly introduce myself, again, I'm Joseph Nelson, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Educational Studies at Swarthmore College, and I'm also director of their Black Studies program and affiliated faculty with the Gender and Sexuality Studies program. And outside of Swarthmore, I'm a senior research fellow with the School Participatory Action Research Collaborative at the University of Pennsylvania, which is a race and gender equity institute that facilitates youth-led research in single-sex schools for boys and single-sex schools for girls. And I'm also a newly appointed editor of the historic journal Men and Masculinities, and I'm on the board of AMSA. And I'm excited to be here with all of you. And here's what you can expect from our time together today. I will kindly introduce our scholar in residence, and then he will have the floor to give his address. And then we'll open it up at the end for questions, comments, thoughts, reactions from all of the audience attendees. So feel free to keep track of your questions. So I will go ahead and begin by introducing our scholar who is a dear friend and colleague. So I'm excited to share space with him yet again. We just had a, a mentoring session that he and I co-led for AMSA attendees. And it was just really nice to share that space with him and provide support and guidance to young scholars in the, the field. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to his brilliant remarks today around a piece of his scholarship. So, Dr. Cesare Warren is a scholar of race and intersectional justice with particular interest in the understanding the conditions that facilitate black boys education success. He has about a decade of professional experience as an urban educator and is recipient of numerous national recognized for his, his scholarship, including the 2018 American Educational Research Association Teaching and Teacher Education Early Career Award. He was a 2019-2020 National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow, and he has held visiting faculty appointments at Stanford University, the University of Pennsylvania, and New York University. Dr. Warren is also a Student Experience Research Network Mid-Career Fellow and a William T. Grant Advanced Quantitative and Computational Scholar. He is the author or editor of three books and more than 35 articles, reports, and chapters. His work has received more than 850,000 in research funding. His most recent book, Centering Possibility in Black Education, was published with Teachers College Press at Columbia University this year on April. And on July 1st of this year, Dr. Warren begins his appointment as Associate Professor of Equity and Inclusion in Education Policy at Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. So I just quickly like to share that Dr. Warren and I met one another when he was a postdoctoral fellow at Penn and I was a, a research associate there at the another institute. And I knew in the very first exchange that I had with Dr. Warren about how his commitment to scholarship was going to change the world in some meaningful and significant way. So I'm glad that he is with AMSA as a scholar in residence. So Dr. Warren, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. And <clears throat> to the organizers and uh, uh, Jeff, thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here and to share um, some remarks and I look forward to an engaging conversation and I'm not gonna waste time. I'm gonna share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see it. Okay. All right. Set my timer. <laughs> Make sure we have lots of time to talk. So uh, thank you again for having me. I'm Cesare Warren. I'm from Chicago. Um, as uh, Joseph shared, I'm starting on the faculty at, at Vanderbilt, but I spent the last seven years at Michigan State University um, there as an associate professor, assistant, and then associate professor of urban education and teacher education. And so I'm really excited to talk really about my journey and my learning as someone who's always been interested in um, improving outcomes for black boys, 
but also this journey of, of bringing to bear more intersectional feminist and gender sexuality perspectives on my study of young black men and boys. And so this work is representative of some of that learning uh, in over the years. So let's we'll get started. So I want to say a little bit about what brings me to the work. I am a black man, though, who was once a black boy uh, on the south side of Chicago, who went to Chicago public schools, who then would eventually become a teacher in Chicago public schools and a, an administrator, and became increasingly frustrated with the ways that we both talked about and characterized black boys, but also um, with how unequipped or ill-equipped um, schools were to respond specifically and particularly to the needs of Black boys um, as those needs sort of showed up. Uh, and so in this sort of space, when I began doing this work, there was lots of hoopla and lots of noise around saving Black boys. Um, and part of how we um, approached that as a discipline in education, um, folks started schools that were specifically for Black boys. Um, single, we, we see a growth in um, single sex, um, uh, middle school and high schools for Black boys all around the country. Uh, and then there was Arnie Duncan who went to Morehouse and said, we need more Black men teachers in the classroom. And now the, the landscape, the uh, education landscape is filled with organizations um, and fellowships that are committed to recruiting, retaining, um, and advancing the practice of Black men teachers. In particular, the sort of underlying logic being that Black men teachers can in many ways improve and advance the academic outcomes of Black boys. And there is some data to su suggest that. But one of the questions uh, that continued to sort of ring in my mind the further along I was in my work is that, what exactly are we saving Black boys from? Uh, and this is something, again, that is a reoccurring question that I think we have to ask ourselves, particularly because we offer narratives of, of Black boys as being in need of saving. And the question is, what are we saving them from? And in many ways, folks would answer that by saying, saying that without saying, um, they need to be saved from themselves rather than being saved from the systems that create the conditions that Black boys are um, sort of forced to occupy. So if we look at a graphic like this one, this was published maybe four years ago, uh, and folks may recognize this um, image. It was published by H&M. And if you just take a moment, what do you notice? And more importantly, why do you notice it? One of the things that I want to point out is that early in one's life, a black boy, and this is a boy, not a man, not an adult, although there's compelling evidence for the ways that black boys become adults of five, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but that these sort of images that are published in 2016 have a historical precedent and are in many ways uh, hearkening back to messages that have long been um, sort of put forward in the public imagination around Black people and Black boys as animals, right? And as uh, and what the, the purpose of such messages is to eliminate the possibility of Black people's and Black boys' humanity. And so this shirt, Coolest Monkey in the Jungle, on the Black boy, and I think it's interesting to juxtapose the Black boy with the white boy because it, it starts to also give us some tacit understanding for the ways that we should be um, seeing blackness versus whiteness. You know, we don't always understand good unless we have some picture of evil. And so you put these things together, it kind of sends these messages that we've all internalized around blackness as inferior and whiteness as superior. But it's also the case that black boys have been sort of caricatured uh, as animals and as monkeys. And we, we've seen lots of evidence of that, but I'm not gonna spend much of my time today sort of talking through that. But I wanna share just a little bit of research. We know that black faces tend to be associated with negativity, that young black men and boys are perceived to be more of a threat than their white counterparts. Young black men and boys are seen as older and less innocent than their white counterparts. 
Young black men and boys tend to be largely imagined as threatening or dangerous, and they inspire a fear uh, similar to arachnophobia and white perceivers. And black boyhood is socially unimagined and unimaginable. Right. And again, there is so much work in the last 20 years that further confirm the ways that we don't see black boys as boys, as children. And furthermore, the ways that we start to imagine black people and black men as threats to public safety. And with that then becomes a general presumption of their deviance. And that deviance gets projected onto their body, especially as juxtaposed against white bodies, which is um, uh, always assuming innocence. White supremacy relies upon dispossession of Native peoples and the enduring exploitation and degradation of all peoples, Black people and Native people included. Let's not continue to operate in terms of our understanding by limiting white supremacy to particular people and moments. It is a system-wide set of logics that are intended to maintain white dominance. And so part of uh, my thinking about gender and sexuality is very much informed by the ways that I understand race to be uh, sort of structuring um, how it is that we engage with or understand our varying other identities, right? So uh, to be a woman is one thing, but to be a Black woman is another thing, right? And so it's important to be able to identify and, and notice the ways that race mediates sort of how other identities are expressed and performed. Anti-Blackness, though, shows up as particularly important for more precisely naming the contours of Black people and Black boys' dehumanization. And so this is really useful as a frame as I go and start to talk a bit more about where and how I see gender playing out in the ways that um, schools then and then Black men teachers interact and handle Black boys. For the sake of time, I'm going to move quickly uh, past this slide, but the one thing that I, I wanna just point out is that anti-Blackness uh, comes out of uh, English, uh, English literature scholars and scholars in Black studies and cultural studies who make a really specific argument around the enduring effects of slavery and therefore the subsequent logics that would represent Blackness as full of disdain and as Black bodies as disposable. So this, this notion of humanity has to be something that we contend with in any sort of discussion around improving the academic or social experiences of Black children in schools. And that brings me to um, this video. So as I know that there are folks who are watching in the live stream, as you're watching this, just pay attention to what the boys say how adults describe themselves in this school, and we'll pick our conversation up from there. We opened up a prep because, frankly, in the city of Chicago, we are African American families are in crisis. We've got a 60 percent high school dropout rate, 2.5% college completion rate. Many of us, we didn't have much hope for ourselves as far as our future was concerned. I really didn't have any thoughts about college. I was just trying to graduate eighth grade. And part of what we have to do here at Urban Prep is change those statistics. We want to increase the number of African-American young men who are earning college degrees in this city and in this country. It means a lot to be here, to be at a school where people care about me to be somewhere that I know that people want me to succeed. It motivates you to do the things that you think you cannot do, like apply to college. It made me think about college now. I'm very excited to go to college. They are supportive, and I think that's the biggest key in this whole school is just the support that they have for us. To become the well-rounded person that I grab once we become, so I have the tools that I need to succeed in college. We want them to grow up to be exceptional and being real positive contributors to their society. They just offer a vast amount of opportunities for my brothers to just excel. Like going to colleges and universities, like uh, University of Michigan 
And Stanford, but this summer I'm going to a junior law program at DePaul University, study abroad program that takes me to South Africa to study engineering, which is one of the most mind-blowing opportunities I've ever had in my entire life. It's tough to be what you don't see. And so we take our jobs role models to these young men very, very seriously. We want to make sure that our students see examples in men and women who work at Urban Prep of excellence, of exceptionality, the positive role models, the positive people that are around you every day. It puts us in a position to pursue success. They're always complimenting us and they're always giving us advice. Like there are our own parents pushing me to accomplish greater things that I never thought I could ever do. I'm able to like climb mountains. These teachers really care about my future. Everyone is here to help you in the college counseling area, teachers, staff, and your kids. Every person around you with young men that actually want something out of their lives. Yeah, they be trapped by staying on top of my stuff and bringing my friends along with me. It's like we love each other, but we two men, we have to say it. These guys are serious. They're serious about their futures. They're serious about what they're doing. They understand, as our creed says, that they have a responsibility to themselves, to their community, and to their world. And our creed says, we are college found, we're exceptional. Our creed said, and we work hard at it. I try to represent being exceptional each and every day. They believe the creed, they believe those words, they understand that they're college found. And our students have done it with our 100% college acceptance rate. For our graduates, that's proof positive that our young men understand that they're going to change the world. Being here at Urban Prep is changing my life. Well, I'm very excited about my future. Um, I'm shooting for the stars. I want to go to a good college. I want to come back with knowledge to help support my family. I want to become a mechanical engineer. Once I get my degree in engineering, I want to go to law. I will be known for my success. With everything that Urban Prep has provided us, we can accomplish greater things. We don't have to settle for it. At least, we can shoot for the best. This is what happens when we So, so Urban Prep Charter Academy for Young Men in Chicago, uh, as I started to sort of share at the, as, as the introduction in this talk, is responding to this sort of persistent and dominant narrative around Black boys as anti-intellectuals, hyper-deviant, as not really interested in school. And part of what they're doing in their tagline is, uh, changing the narrative, right, which is assuming that there is a narrative that, that is dominant. Um, and in doing so, they have a particular caricature or character of Black boyhood or Black manhood that continues to be projected. If you notice, I'm just going to share some of the lines from the video that can start to demonstrate a little bit of the school's ideology about black boyhood and black manhood that I think is really important that comes out in this video, right? And you'll see <clears throat> um, that's the references to males in society and then a sort of picture of what being successful looks like Right, and college tends to be a huge part of that. And I'm thinking of Andrea Hunter and James Earl Davis's work, um, sort of groundbreaking work in the 90s, where they explore how Black men articulate their own manhood and masculinities. And much of how they understand themselves to be men uh, is connected to their ability to provide. So there's a, a huge, significant um, uh, connection to their class identity or their understanding of a class position in their articulation of manhood and masculinity that this school sort of reflects in many ways. Positive role models. And here's the one that probably a lot of you call. It's like we love each other, but we're too manly to say it. So part of why I bring the school up is because this study is a uh, part of a larger and a broader project of trying to understand how this particular school positioned its graduates from its first graduating class to persist into and through college. Uh, and in our conversations with the young men in that, in that study, there were all of these conversations, or, or sorry, references to Black men teachers and um, the relationships that they had with those, with those teachers. Uh, and one of those teachers at one time happened to be 
myself. So I'm also outing that I was one of the founding math teachers at Urban Prep. But at the time that the project was conducted, I was already gone for uh, almost a decade. So we know that schools like this pop up and have become much more popular in the last 15 years. And I'm also thinking of a book by Keisha Lindsay, who argues that folks who start single-sex schools for boys of color tend to be and make their arguments around uh, opposing deficit perceptions of race, but that these same schools tend to also be anti-feminist, that they have really archaic and hegemonic notions of manhood and masculinity and gender and sexuality that sort of guide and shape how they structure themselves. Right, so we know the, from the literature that diverse representations of manhood and masculinity are key to advancing black boys' school success. That in schools where black men teachers are, they, they, black men teachers are too often positioned in ways that reinforce rather than resist cis patriarchy and hegemonic notions of manhood and masculinity. Adolescent black boys, especially uh, as they move into and through high school, have greater regard for gender when it comes to how they view themselves than they do their racial identity. And that's from uh, Ani Rogers' important work. And single-sex schools designed for boys of color tend to have a masculinizing function. So this is the context in which an urban prep sort of comes out. And part of what this literature um, uh, is uh, demonstrating in many ways, as someone who is primarily trained from a, a, a race standpoint, is that race and gender are indeed mutually constituted. They inform one another in ways that create and produce advantages or disadvantages. But when it comes to Black men and Black boys, too little of the research is considered the ways that gender is muted and does mute uh, uh, how then Black boys experience race gender, intersectional race gender um, uh, oppression, and particularly as it relates to then forms of death and dying, significant to shaping how they will navigate the world and then how they kind of understand themselves in the world as human beings. So in this particular study uh, and the paper from which it um, emerges, I actually took a step back and employed a genre perspective. And genre can be understood as categories of the human. So I'm starting with the premise that schooling, <clears throat> much like every uh, social institution in society, insists upon the death and dying of Black people, in part because Blackness is not imagined as a human attribute. So genre can be understood as categories of the human, but it is a call in particular, as Sylvia Winter articulates it, to reimagine Blackness, Black boyhood and manhood and Black sexuality in a way that completely reconsiders common sense notions of humanity. Popular discussions of race, gender oppression tend to situate Black men as disadvantaged by race, but privileged because of their gender and sexuality, especially for those who are identified as heterosexual. Black feminists, such as the members of the Combahee River Collective, have insisted that their fight requires racial and gender accord with Black men, not enmity. And improving outcomes for Black youth and adults must work in tandem to disavow Western conceptions of humanity in our research and thus establish new understandings of humanity from community rather than for community. And Tommy Curry uh, further contends in his book, The Man Not, that genre expresses how the register of non-being, and I think about the language of non-being as also connected to uh, uh, Christina Sharp's work in The Wake, how it distorts the categories founded upon white anthropology. So in many ways, the argument for the use of genre is to <clears throat> get back to and be attentive to the ways that our traditional discussions of gender do not contend with the ways that race is impacting and shaping um, Black boys and Black people's understanding of their gender selves, right? And so to understand their gender selves, in many ways, ha we have to understand where and how their humanity has been compromised in this society and how articulations of humanity are directly connected to the ways that we tend to understand and study gender. The historical precedent for violence experienced by Black men and boys at the intersection of their Blackness, sex, and sexual identity too rarely inform research analyses of their contemporary plight. 
One very public example includes the baseless accusation of sexual misconduct aimed at white women that leads to a black man or boy's death, such as in the case of Emmett Till. How do we reconcile inspiring black boys towards versions of success and exceptionality, as I just showed you in um, the previous clip of Urban Prep, in a social context that necessitates their death and dying? I'm thinking about the difficulty of more precisely discerning the converging forces of anti-Black racism and white supremacy first, that before we can get to gender, <clears throat> is robbing Black people of our humanity, dispossessing us of our own bodies, beginning this trajectory in chattel slavery, and then as a result, redefining the possibilities for the lives that we can lead well into the future. It seems to me that understanding race, gender, justice begins with understanding and considering one's humanity and the ways that schools have been structured to indeed be dehumanizing. If blackness has been imagined as non-human, as inhuman or non-being, so has Black people's gender, thereby invisibilizing, for instance, the covert ways that Black boys' sex and sexuality uniquely render them susceptible to violence. If this is true, it makes sense that Black men and boys would reproduce hegemonic notions of manhood and toxic masculinity that lead to patriarchy and heterosexism. This is because the only versions of manhood and masculinity they have had access to tend to be anchored in definitions of humanity that belong to whiteness and white people, and such definitions necessitate black death and dying. Genre expands the analysis of gender in ways that point to the historical, social, and cultural contexts that are responsible for political constructions of blackness. And as and in as much, those constructions eliminate the possibility of black boys' humanity. And as such, black boys then have little claim to novel articulations of race, gender, sexuality, and so on, specific to their own most authentic, genuine, and authentic and genuine visions and versions of their own lives. And this vision is really important because these Black adolescent boys, as in the case of uh, Urban Prep, come into the building having some understanding, right, having been socialized to gender, as you'll see, gender and sexuality, but this school sort of constructs itself as the place where it will offer a portrait of Black manhood and successful Black manhood, as I'll sort of show in the, in the, the ways that these, these young men who were participants in the study talked about their relationships with Black men teachers. Understanding race, gender oppression then requires a reformulation of gender that is rooted in Black people's own articulations and expressions of their humanity. Discerning the significance of these young men's interactions with their Black men teachers required that I establish as a researcher, but also as someone who had some rapport with them because I was their teacher at one point, a more precise understanding of their humanity there. And when I use the language of humanity, really what I'm saying is, how do how they articulate their own desires, their own values, what it is that they want and need uh, in the world. It was important that to get some understanding of their understanding of gender in relationship to their teachers, that I needed to have some understanding of how they articulate their humanity. I employed a genre theoretical perspective to guide my interpretation of their stories. And by using this lens, it enabled uh, a more uh, specific and precise analysis of the efficacy of black men, of black boys' interactions with their black male teachers. And traditional, as I sort of share, actually I'll, I'll move forward from there. I want to say this work is not meant in any way to detract from or discount the decades of important research by black feminists who demonstrate the ways that black men indeed participate in patriarchal and heterosexist political economies. I'm thinking about Patricia Hill Collins' work. But I aim to extend the, this work by offering important contributions to the ways that we imagine Black men's interactions, specifically with Black boys, as a site of resistance that can function to counter anti-Blackness and oppose white supremacist hierarchies of gender and sexuality. So <clears throat> a lot of things will say, a lot of the work will say, we need to uh, get more Black men teachers and we need to build relationships 
And this work was really trying to understand the substance of those interactions, the building blocks of such relationships, and what those interactions can do in terms of reimagining Black boyhood and then uh, well into Black manhood. All right. And if you have questions about the actual study, I'm happy to answer those. I want to get to the findings and, and open this uh, conversation up. So the primary research question for the study was how do a group of young black men, the first graduates of an urban single sex high school, describe the influence of interactions with black men teachers specific to their understandings of black manhood and masculinities. The young men referenced a rigidity in their interactions that for several of them posed a new conundrum of power that felt unfamiliar. The young men tended to begin their remarks and at the time that they were interviewed, they were, uh, 20, I think the youngest person was 20. Um, so they were somewhere between 20 and 21, and they were four years on track to graduate from college within six years of their initial enrollment. So the young men tended to begin their remarks by distinguishing their interpersonal exchanges with women teachers from the interactions they remembered having with their black men teachers. Several of the young men used adjectives that positioned their women teachers as softer, more nurturing than what they would expect from a man. Moreover, while they imagine men teachers to be tough and less permissive than the women teachers who um, taught them previously, they also describe the awkwardness of interacting with male authority figures at the school. As was the case for over half of the participants, high school was the first time that they regularly interacted with black men teachers and other professional black men inside the local schools they had attended. And um, urban prep at the time that they were students, more than 50% of their teachers were black men. So they interacted with a significant number of black men teachers in the four years that they attended that particular high school. Similarly, a few other participants discussed feeling as if the interactional or teaching style of their Black men teachers was more demanding than what they experienced in elementary school. Up until the point they attended Baldwin, or attended this particular school, um, <clears throat> teaching was to them a woman's job. Bearing in mind that much of one's gender socialization happens through everyday interactions within, with, and between social institutions and environmental contexts, the data suggests that these young men's early messages about manhood and masculinity were likely shading interpretations of their black men teachers automatically pegging them as strict, especially when juxtaposed to their previous experiences being taught by majority women teachers. In some ways, being smart or intellectual was also then seen as feminine. Being tough and strong was seen as more masculine. Now, hopefully you've had a moment to so to check out these quotes on screen. So there were two major themes um, that came out of the study. And one of them was this frequent reference to their Black men teachers and the interactions that they had with them as mentors and father figures. So they very much identified uh, their Black men teachers to uh, perform a sort of patriarchal function in the school. And this makes me think again of uh, Patricia Hill Collins' work when she talks about the, head, the, the family unit being a sort of model of patriarchy and the Black man sort of being uh, configured at the top. Uh, and so in many ways, these young men talk about their teachers as the model, as the picture of, 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 of a father, uh, particularly in the ways that they came to understand care and the, the, the more soft uh, emotions that they were more often associated with women being now associated with uh, these Black men teachers. Their positionality as teachers, as mentors and father figures, center on understandings of themselves, similar to what Fergus McGuire and Martin referred to as masculinizing agents. The school purposely granted authority for these men to be role models, specifically asking them to teach boys, right? Because they're boys at 14. But as soon as they start, they are socializing to becoming young men. Such roles project for the young men norms for race and gender. And there, there was lots of strong racial, so, uh, explicit racial socialization, but a far more implicit gender socialization. Like Davis and others who study masculinity, it is viewed as tough and aggressive. And the boys to this point, the boys to this point, 
uh, talk about having had majority women teachers. So noticing black men cry, for example, or make themselves available in ways that the boys, the, the young men at this time, uh, described as care was both very, very formative. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Was unfamiliar, but also um, quite surprising and a welcomed sort of uh, engagement. These interactions, as the young men described them, also then helped to redefine possibilities for who they could be in the world. Where these black boys having come into the building, have become really clear about what the boundaries were for their gender expression. And some of that, a lot of that is connected to where they lived and how they needed to, to move through um, the urban spaces that they navigated between home and school um, for the, the sake of their personal safety. The second thing had to do with this frequent reference to the successful Black man. Dominant conceptions of Black man manhood are understood as Black men teachers middle to upper class socioeconomic status, socioeconomic status the heteronormative romantic partnerships, and the sort of embodiment of Christian values. And this just came up multiple times around Black men having wives, having children, having gone to college, having owned homes which in many ways, again, reflects a more dominant hegemonic sort of uh, understanding of, of manhood and masculinity. And Black men teachers reflect the school's value and standard for young manhood. And this, you would have noticed in the video, they said exceptional a lot, uh, because that was something that, that um, uh, teachers were encouraged to constantly help, um, expose the students to and give them a way of thinking about themselves that in many ways then detach them from the more dominant narratives of black manhood that tend to depict them as thugs and deviant, right? Um, and in, in many ways, this school stands out and in the ways that the market, mark, markets itself is sort of sends this tacit message that the black boys who go to this school um, are no longer a threat to public safety, right? This is we, we're, we're making a version of black boys, black boys into young black men who um, the public can be proud of and that the public shouldn't be afraid of. And one of the other things that I'll say is that, um, you know, this, this sort of subtle socialization into gender with the frequent reference to these young men, not by their first name or not by their preferred name, but by their surname. So from day one at 14, we call the students Mr. Um, and, and that, again, sets a tone for, for, um, for manhood and masculinity in the school that over time, the boys start to police themselves. And I'm thinking about the work of, of uh, Elon Dancy and the Brother Code and also Tony Lang who talk about uh, the ways that manhood and masculinity codes get set up in, in um, social institutions like schools so well that adults do not have to reinforce them, that students will start to reinforce them and police one another. When we consider genres or categories of humanity in particular, Black men and Black people tend to be genred as non-human and animalistic. Anti-Blackness is a logic of disdain for Black people that anchors the unconscionable justifications used to rationalize our death and dying, physical and symbolic, inside school and outside. Despite the good intentions of the school's founder, a Black man from the South Side of Chicago, Black school leaders and Black men teachers who model successful Black manhood, what it means to be uh, father figures and role models, the failure to acknowledge the significance of anti-Blackness specifically for the ways that society and the world sort of reduces our humanity to nothingness is really important for them further understanding where and how gender is showing up in, in these boys sort of experience at the school and then subsequently how they start to imagine the possibilities for the lives that they can lead beyond school. I'll talk a, a, a bit more about this in depth in my book and we'll just move past this and I'll close here. Regardless of how Black men teachers 
are positioned by others, like any teacher, they can either advance regimes of gender oppression or become better accomplices to multiply subordinated Black people, namely Black women and Black queer people who are engaged in the ongoing concurrent fight for gender justice. All right, and I'm happy to take some questions. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Warren. If we could, in this virtual space, there would be a thunderous round of applause and a standing ovation for your brilliant remarks here. So questions have been coming into the chat. So let me identify a couple for me to share with you. So the first question just asked you to speak more about or unpack further the notion that single sex schools designed for boys of color serve as a masculinizing function. Yeah, so um, uh, the book Schooling for Resilience, uh, Eddie Fergus, Pedro McGuire, Martin Martin, they studied a series of single sex schools around the country that serve predominantly black Boy, uh, black and Latinx boys. And part of what they found was that these schools place an emphasis essentially on creating an archetype of manhood and masculinity that they wanted their students to emulate. And as I shared with you, uh, I made a brief reference to Andrea Hunter and James Earl Davis's work uh, and talking to Black men about how they define and articulate their manhood and masculinity. Those definitions tended to be connected to their class position. So part of being a man is being able to um, take care of your family, right? Being able to um, make money and take care of your family. So <clears throat> I think part of the function or the use of that language was a masculinizing function is that these schools are intentional about offering portraits of manhood and masculinity that they want their students to um, eventually uh, embody and dem demonstrate. And I'll tell you a story. When I was talking, of, um, going out and doing talks about my book when it first came out, I would have urban prep teachers and alum in the audience. And I remember talking to one principal who shared with me uh, about an experience that he had with a student. We'll, we'll call him um, John. Uh, this student would come and sit in his office every day. And he just didn't understand why the student would come and sit in his office. And so he asked the student, you know, like, I'm going to follow you. After two weeks of him just coming and sitting in his office, he said, I want to follow you around to your classes. And what the student said to him in response to why he was sitting in the office, he said, nobody sees me, nobody talks to me, right? So he follows him around. He's like, surely in a school this size, you're saying eight teachers a day, somebody sees you, somebody's talking to you. But he said, nobody will speak to this student and nobody would really acknowledge this student. This was this student identified as queer and did not perform his gender was not the what what um, folks would like to say is the most masculine right he didn't perform his masculinity in ways that align with the dominant norms of masculinity in that particular school, and so it invisibilized him among his peers but also among his adults. So there's a sort of code around masculinity that gets developed in the building that does not have to be taught explicitly, but simply is modeled by adults and then emulated by students. Because, and part of what these relationships did was that they really built, the, the educators built a lot of trust. And so once these boys had a lot of trust in these adults, they wanted to be just like them. And in many ways, they would say um, the, a creed every day. And, and part of that creed was that they were exceptional and they work hard. And then every day they were going to class and they were supposed to see a picture of that creed in the body of their black male educators that then demonstrated to them what masculinity was and what it wasn't without anyone ever actually saying that. I hope I answered that question. Excellent, excellent. And just a related question in your research, did you identify settings or contexts or experiences within these single sex schools for boys of color that allowed for resisting of these traditional norms of masculinity or, or black masculinity in particular? It, now, speaking from my experience, no, there, I didn't, I didn't know those, those faces. 
having removed now, they may be. I know that um, there's one campus in mind that I know has like a gay straight alliance where there are now more counter spaces. Uh, but this is, you know, years later. And at the time of this study, these boys would have been out of high school four years, at least four years removed from uh, high school. Many of them actually five years. So <clears throat> I can't speak to whether or not they existed, but there were, there were, one of the things that that question is making me think about is there were lots of boys who resisted like tucking their shirts in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was like a huge part. Like you had to dress the part. Certs, you know, uh, clothes clean. It was a, a certain certain tie jacket. When they would leave the building, they would rip those clothes off. I've come to understand that as part of a protective mechanism because walking through their neighborhoods in a, in a suit made them a target. But then I know that the boys in the building who really resisted sort of um, conforming to this this uniform, who grew locks, who wanted longer hair, they, some of them just didn't stay. And and um, I don't want to make the claim that they were pushed out, but some might say that they were pushed out. Um, because what I do know is that the culture of the school was very um, compelling, <laughs> is, a, is the best way that I can sort of describe it, where if you were not with the program, you felt it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. All right, so our second question here is, thanks for the excellent talk. Would you be willing to expand on the theme you mentioned of the contribution made by Black queer perspectives in discussions of boys' education? Expand on the theme of the contributions made by Black queer perspectives. Is that? Yes, yes. On Black boys' education. Um. That's a good question. Uh, well, what I will say about um, how I'm understanding that question, the, the Combahee River Collective uh, and the statement that they make in the 70s as they're articulating Black feminism, I think when we talk about um, Black men and Black boys, uh, uh, race, gender, race, sexuality, uh, oppression, we t sometimes that work gets put uh, in a space that is it's antagonizing to Black feminism, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, and I, I say that because, you know, Black queer women are, you know, the progenitors, particularly in the, in the Combahee River Collective, are the progenitors of, of uh, black, black feminism. And so Black queer perspectives have always been really important for offering more nuanced and more um, complicated notions of a problem, right? Uh, and, and that's been, I, I think of, uh, of Lance McCready's work and Ed Brockenbrough's work who help us to understand the ways that Black men teachers uh, sort of get positioned in schools as disciplinarians, as, as role models. And that, form, that has a particular function in service to white dominance and sustaining hegemonic notions of manhood and masculinity. That again, uh, I, you know, folks don't necessarily say this, but I remember myself as a black man teacher and how it is that I was always asked to come work with the black boys. And I didn't quite always understand that because I was like, I'm very different from these black boys. And for, I didn't grow up in their communities. I don't have the perspectives that you think I have just because of, I, I'm a black man body. And it says something about then how um, the sort of, uh, of conceptions of black manhood that, that get created and then institutionalized and then black men teachers become props. So I think black queer, um, uh, scholars have, have just helped to further define that and to name how it is that Black men teachers can become and be positioned as props and how we need to actually be conscious of that such that we're not um, reducing Black men teachers to this function of disciplinarian and then robbing them of the opportunity to have more uh, I mean, expansive, uh, more expansive engagements with young people around issues of not just race, but also gender, because there was so much more explicit conversation about race than it was gender. And, and what I appreciate about Ani Rogers' work is that she demonstrates in her work that we're talking so much about race, but these boys are actually thinking a lot about gender 
and, and giving a lot of attention to their gendered selves, um, but that both are, are mutually constituted. So we can't mute gender um, in the ways that we're talking about Black boys. And I think Black queer scholars have been really important for naming that. Yes, yes. And that it's kind of putting out there that in the current research around single-sex schools for boys of color, there is an archetype of a boy that they're looking to create right. and construct. Right. When within their school communities, there's so much variation and variability amongst and diversity amongst the boys and their boyhoods that are playing out in this space. And some of them are fitting into this archetype and others are not. Are not, right. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, and then what happens to the boys that don't fit in? How are they experiencing this school environment, especially in terms of their sense of their identity development? You know, let alone their 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 education. God. All right, so uh, let's see if some other questions are coming in here. Got it. All right, so there's there's no more at the moment. We do have a couple of minutes left. So if there are other insights or thoughts that you would like to share, Dr. Warren, you're more than welcome to. I guess maybe one question I have for you that's lingering is always in the area of resistance, where, you know, um, what do we see potentially as the promise of these types of learning contexts to help us reimagine what boyhood could look like? I think of organizations like the International Boys School Coalition or the National Association of Single Sex Public Schools. Now they're being asked, how are, are you creating all male spaces in ways that don't perpetuate or reproduce the types of black males that you know often get presented in the media as inflicting harm on black women coming from a black feminist perspective? Yeah. So I guess what do you see as, as maybe the, the, the promise or potential that's there? I, I, I think it's really important to create. I think affinity spaces are important. This is like an affinity space on a really large scale in terms of like an entire school. But I think having spaces where you can, where Black men and boys can be in conversation with one another, I think the intergenerational uh, the opportunity for intergenerational dialogue around really critical issues for shaping one's future self is really important and valuable. How those spaces get stewarded is, uh, I think, where we have to dig in and do our work. And I think that um, people are always creating spaces for themselves uh, as they need them. Uh, so to your earlier question about uh, how students have resisted, I think that we don't always notice it as adults, but students are always finding ways to find others like them and to create um, and curate opportunities to heal and then strategize how they navigate other more assaultive spaces. Uh, and I think that the work just draws more attention to being able to just name that and honor that and then just to continue to dig in and be more critical. Whatever the critique is that I might have about this school, I don't think that the school is bad. I think that it's important that it exists as an option and as an alternative, because I think that there are spaces like this, single sex spaces, where some students are going to thrive. And then this is not a space where every student's going to thrive. So there needs to be options, right? Uh, but I think the space is itself important. Wonderful. All right, Dr. Warren, well, we are at time. And again, I just want to thank you for serving as our scholar in residence this year. Thank and we you. can be in a space together where, again, we can sure. give you a thunderous applause and a standing ovation. But I would like for folks to have maybe your contact information. So if they have other questions, comments, thoughts, reactions to share with you, that they can be more than happy to, to reach out. So I don't know if you want to share your, your email or Twitter handle. Oh, you sure. Um, you can email me at chesare.warren at Vanderbilt. Uh, dot edu, or I'm on Twitter at Cesare Augustus, August, August Us is how it's spelled in my first name uh, on Twitter. So I'm not hard to find on the internet. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you again, sir, and thank you everyone for attending and be well and enjoy the rest of the AMSA conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.